everyone, and welcome to tonight's program, Virtual Animation in Action, Matt Bollinger. As we do with all of our programs, we'd like to recognize the importance of the role cultural, in cultural institutions have in the formation of collective memory. As part of that work, we want to acknowledge that we are situated upon the traditional lands of the Adena, Hopewell, Monongahela, Osage, Delaware, Shawnee, and Seneca Cayuga peoples. We honor all of the indigenous nations and their land with great gratitude. As a museum of American art, we use the power of art to explore and reveal the erasure of many lived experiences that compromise the complexity of American history. Again, welcome to tonight's program, Animation in Action, Matthew Bollinger. Matt is one of five living artists in our new exhibition, Alone Together. The exhibition Alone Together encounters an American realism, brings together images of human connection and disconnection to reflect upon shared experiences of difficult times. The exhibition stages encounters between artworks from the early to mid 20th century and works created by five contemporary artists grappling with what it feels like to live in the world right now. We are joined today, of course, by Matt Bollinger, and we're going to be watching two of his animations between the days in three rooms. And again, we will have commentary by the artist himself. As we're talking, please feel free to put any questions you have in the chat, and we will be ending with, with a Q&A as well. A little bit more about Matt Bollinger. Matt received his BFA from the Kansas City Art Institute and his MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design. His work has been exhibited in solo shows in New York, Los Angeles, Paris, and London. Recent museum exhibitions have been at the South Bend Museum of Art, the Schneider Museum, and Musée d'Art Moderne, Saint Etienne. Residencies include the Seven Below Arts Initiative in Burlington, Vermont, the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, Massachusetts, and the Sharp Wellentes Studio Program in Brooklyn, New York. In 2016 and 2021, he received NYFA fellowships in painting. He is represented by Mother's Tank Station and lives and works in New York State. Welcome, Matt. Super excited for the program tonight. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Hannah, and, and uh, thanks to the museum, both for this screening, uh, which I'm really thrilled to be a part of, and uh, the exhibition, which I'm also thrilled to be a part of. So thanks so much. Of course, we're thrilled to have you too. Uh, shall I dive right in? Absolutely, yeah, go ahead whenever you're ready. So uh, the first, of my animations that we're gonna to show tonight is Between the Days. And uh, I'll just, I'll give a, a brief introduction to uh, each of the videos uh, before they start. And then uh, throughout, I'll, I'll uh, we'll pause and uh, I'll give some background, some context. I'll talk about the process. Um, and uh, thank you to Erica, who's behind the scenes making all the technology work. All I'm doing is is just uh, sitting with a cup of tea in my studio. Um, so Between the Days uh, tells uh, the story of a single day in the life of a mother and her adult son. Uh, they live together. Um, and uh, over the course of that day, which starts in the morning and goes until uh, uh, the mother is asleep and the, the son is home at the end of the day, um, you see them going through their routine, and the animation was intended as a loop to be seen to, seen in a gallery, um, something that uh, felt like an endless string of days. Um, so while uh, the playthrough is distinct and it's, it repeats, it, it could also feel like a replacement for any day in the lives of the two characters. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, maybe say just that as far as the narrative is concerned. Um, the, the animation uh, aspect is that everything I'm, I'm doing with very few exceptions, and I'll, I'll be happy to talk about those, um, but everything I'm doing is uh, animated on uh, paintings, and uh, they're uh, from a wide range of sizes of canvas from uh, fairly small easel sized canvases, 16 by 20 inches, that size, to uh, very large seven foot uh, immersive canvases. Um, and so you you see that kind of history of change and uh, adjustment on those surfaces. Um, and that was important to me. I wanted to make paintings, I wanted to make animations with paintings and then the paintings would live on afterward. 
um, which they did. And when I originally exhibited the animation, I also showed the body of paintings that I made alongside it. Um, so with that, let, let's go ahead and uh, start Between the Days. I will go ahead and pause it there. Um, just as the guitar shredding begins, um, I'll, I'll a little comment on the music. So um, part of what I uh, like about making animations, making videos, um, is that I, I get to sort of funnel all the different things that I'm interested in into one piece, into the studio. Um, and uh, I've been a kind of amateur musician uh, my my whole life, and so uh, once I incorporated music making into the the animation process, it became uh, uh, it became like part of my job. Like I had to practice and uh, spend time writing things, writing music. So uh, all the music and the the videos uh, I I write and perform. Um, I also record all the sound myself. Um, I voice a lot of the characters when there is a voice. Uh, 
So I was the guy on the radio. I was also singing the awkward country song that that she was listening to. Um, but I really enjoy that aspect. Um, it, it, the animation part takes significantly longer than the sound, but the sound feels like 40% of the work in terms of making things move and feel alive. Um, so in the, in the beginning, you see uh, the sun cleaning up uh, what at the end of the video you'll you'll see is the mother's uh, emptying her ashtrays, putting away, throwing away her beer cans, kind of cleaning up after the, of the the previous night's uh, leavings, and with the idea that this is just going to be a loop that that goes and goes. Um, and uh, she gets ready and goes off to uh, to work at um, at a factory. It's a, a factory that I actually worked at in Kansas City. Um, and he goes here, we'll see him. Um, he goes nowhere in particular that we can ascertain. And we kind of lose track of him for the, the, uh, the rest of the day after this scene uh, that you're about to make, that you're about to see. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead. Thank you, Erica. All right, if we could pause for just a moment. Um, uh, that sequence is fairly short, but uh, it's it took uh, about 40 hours to animate. I, I thought this will be a simple <laughs> scene to put together. Um, but because uh, I, I had I had the idea in my mind that I could loop the train going by. Um, and then as soon as I started, I quickly realized I had to just keep painting every train car uh, fractionally moving ahead. Um, but, uh, I, I mentioned this because the, uh, the time spent working on the painting, um, gets kind of embedded in that surface and this painting comes back. Um, this is the, the painting that we saw at the beginning. Uh, it was the interior of the car, um, that he then gets into, you see the front of the house and he drives away. Um, it was about a three by four foot canvas. Um, and then to make the train composition, I realized I had to move the steering wheel down about six inches. But conceptually for me, it was important that the that that painting be the inside of the car, even if uh, it involved repainting every square inch. Um, it was I wasn't going to paint another painting. I, at that moment, I really felt like it needed to be uh, one painting for for each uh, set element, um, almost as though it were like a three dimensional set, uh, that I could enter. Um, so as part of the strangeness of, of, uh, this particular animation, um, I was telling Hannah before the program, uh, started that, that if I, you know, I do a lot of things that are really impractical, um, but they result in sort of showing off the painting or, or the elements of, of how the film is made by, uh, working over paintings again and again. Um, all right, we can keep going.
Okay, we can pause there. Um, so yeah, all the places that she walks past in the factory were jobs that I did. Uh, it was a summer job, um, and I was uh, my my in my position. I was a what was called a floater. It was like anybody that went on vacation, I had to learn their job and do it. Um, and uh, it was it was simultaneously kind of difficult and dangerous, uh, and also incredibly boring. And it started so early in the morning, uh, which uh, at the time was very difficult for me. Um, but uh, yeah, but in, in terms of reconstructing it for the, the film, I had to work with a mixture of memory. Uh, I did find a few photographs of what the factory looked like, um, looks like it still exists. Um, and then I just remembered what the machines were. And so I would research what those, uh, you know, the big, uh, it's sort of a CNC punching machine. Uh, the place made meter boxes. Um, anyway, uh, I didn't work in the accounting department as she does, but uh, that's sort of where I fit her into the context of the, of the film. Um, and work is something that I'm preoccupied with in both my videos and my paintings, uh, images of people working, um, uh, the animation makes people sort of aware of work. It doesn't feel uh, like labor to me when I'm doing them, uh, but it's something that people seem very aware of, that it, you know, animation is known as this time-consuming thing. Um, at the same time, spending time with her screensaver and her spreadsheet and the little uh, magnets and knickknacks and her calendar and all of these kind of banal everyday things that she uses to kind of customize her space. Um, all of that is, has the capacity to transform to me. Um, and so I'm always looking for these moments of disruption to that everyday, uh, habitual kind of, uh, stuff. Um, so the screensaver, for instance, um, is a kind of uh, kinetic abstraction um, that has a kind of surprise in, in that context. Um, I also thought of the spaces in the animation. This is, that was uh, her space. We'll see the sun space a little later. And each of those spaces has a five foot painting. And so I thought, how can I make this painting that doesn't have the figure in it um, how can I make that painting reflect the person who inhabits that space? Um, and this is a theme that comes back with the, the animation that will follow um, three rooms. So uh, sorry for the hot rod sounds. Um, but uh, uh, in any case, these are these are things that uh, I'm really interested in the way that our that we and our lives sort of impress upon the context that we live in and leave traces behind. Um, and the process I use for animation, which shows itself off, is also a process of leaving traces behind. Um, space and, and time, the, the you know, two important fundamental aspects of animation are kind of entwined when you animate on a single surface um, and you see time ticked across the space as somebody moves. All right, we can continue, thank you. If we could pause just for a moment, I promise I won't talk this long after every scene. Um, but uh, so that uh, was one of two large living room paintings uh, uh, that I animated. It's, it's a seven foot painting. 
Um, you saw it in the beginning sequence. And I shot uh, views out the window uh, in close up on that single painting. So afterward, the life in the sort of the life of that that painting, you see all these edges where um, I had done close up animation. Um, my my thinking was um, was how does the house kind of live when the when its inhabitants are gone? Um, it's sort of like what does the dog see when no one's there? Um, and that again is one of those sort of uh, ruptures in the the everyday. Um, and in this case, it's you know it's happening with a with a front door that is kind of like mid level Home Depot quality. Um, and I, I think that that contrast is um, is very potent to me. Um, it's, I find it very uh, exciting and, and attractive. All right, we can continue. stories tonight at 10. I love my morning crunch. Morning crunch cereal, the tasty part of a child's breakfast. Morning crunch. If he's dead, nothing can save him from your body. I never meant to. It just happened. Today, child breakfast. Your trouble will be over an hour. We could pause just for a second. So the uh, if you scroll back just slightly to the previous shot, just like us, there we go. Um, so this is that's this is the second living room painting, and uh, we saw it just a second ago with the lamp lit. Um, and like I was saying about the car interior, I had the idea. I, I sort of believed in the space so much that rather than painting a second uh, dark version of the painting. Um, which would have made it would have been much more practical, and I would have gotten two paintings out of the project. But it, to me, it made more sense to sort of turn the lights out in the painting. Um, so I I mixed up a big uh, cup of of a kind of dark purplish glaze and washed over the entire painting um, except for the screen and just rebuilt the tonal structure uh, with the light uh, turned dark. Um, so it's it, the the paintings have that kind of history built into their surface um, that I think the animation shows, but also that in in the painting itself in the real world uh, that it shows. Um, again, I wanted the spaces to reflect the people that lived there and and their history. Um, so in the tracking shot where I moved across the wall, um, there are the the uh, three men in framed pictures. Uh, and I, I see this as the sort of patrilineage um, that is mostly absent uh, in the in the video. There's a soldier um, 
who we might assume is the father, and then there's an older man, and then there's a young man in a cap and gown, um, kind of graduation photo. Um, in my mind, that was the uh, the young man that we see at the beginning, um, who, although he graduated, has still kind of remained at home, uh, you know, effectively staring at the train, um, thinking about uh, where he might go. Um, all right, we can keep going.
So if you want to um, just pause it and scroll back um, just a little bit to uh, first to the wide shot of the uh, the bench press. It's like where you see the poster on the wall. Kind of just a little earlier. Sorry, I should have been more specific. Um, so as, as uh, Erica is scrolling back, I'll talk about these parts. Um, uh, but uh, during the scene where you see him uh, lifting, if you go just a little further back to the wider shot of that same painting, but that's the that's definitely uh, totally the right painting. Um, there are uh, the the editing moves between this shot of the silhouette bench pressing. And then the close up of that face where you see the ticks of marks going back and forth across. Um, that's the shot. If you can just go scroll back just a little bit further. Um, I should have noted down the time. I apologize. Um, the uh, There's a little contrast there because the perfect, that's the spot. Um, the, uh, the close up of the face, I'm playing the footage forward and back. So you see the, the, uh, history of the paint being removed and added on again and again. Uh, but in the wide shot, uh, I shot the sequence of adding the weights on uh, linearly. So as the painting, uh, as the scene progressed, more and more texture and material built up on the on the canvas. So there was more and more kind of physical weight in the impasto that he seemed to be sort of trying to push off his chest until he couldn't anymore. Um, I wanted to scroll back to this uh, painting because this is the the large uh, what I thought of as the the portrait painting for the Sun character, um, and uh, you know it's populated with the things that uh, kind of matter to him. Just like the other um, had all of these uh, kind of icons that were emblematic of the mother. Um, so uh, in any case, uh, uh, that's kind of the conclusion of that one. Um, uh, I don't know if we want to do any questions now, or do we want to go uh, save them to the end and go to the uh, the next video? I think I think you're on mute. <laughs> Thanks. I just noticed. <laughs> I have some questions, um, and folks who are watching, please feel free to put them in the chat, and we can discuss any questions you have too. Um, so one of my I have a lot of questions, but I'll try to like condense it. <laughs> so. One of my first questions is, what made you decide to highlight a relationship between a mother and a son? Um, yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, I, I, um, I'm trying to think of what it was, what the specific genesis of, of that was. Um, I think I wanted to deal with uh, some problematic masculinity um, and in the son, the kind of uh, aggression that that he shows or that seems to be sort of pent up um, but uh, but to av avoid a simple di dialectic between father and son and the kind of heritage of that um, and so I felt like the relationship with the mother would be more complex um, uh, because they don't immediately they, it's like they they're obviously related they reflect one another but then they're quite different um, and so that opened up all this interesting space. When I removed, when I when I put him and the mother together and removed the father, there was suddenly all this tension there. Um, but strangely, I can't, I don't remember the exact, uh, normally I sort of spend a lot of time, like a year chewing on the idea of the animation. Um, and I think with this one, I was thinking so much about the space um, and, the, and the sort of habit of this one day, um, it just sort of, clicked to have the two of them together. Um, 
Yeah, I don't I don't have any particular I don't have like a super fantastic answer to that one. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> That's still an answer. I just I just found, you know, like the the dynamic that they have too very interesting where like she at the end she like hears all of these weights drop and then just lights a cigarette. You know, like she doesn't like jump, leap out of bed like what's going on. I thought that was an interesting choice mm -hmm. too. So um it's I I like how you you're talking about like this this conversation of like toxic masculinity and then having that like paralleled with his mother. That's, that's cool. I also, um, I know like the first thing I noticed when we got to her office was like that cute Garfield magnet. <laughs> um, so when you're like animating them, you know, like you're, you're like animating their personalities. What did you base that off of? Did you base it off of anybody you knew? Did you base it off of like, just you made these characters up and their personalities up they're they're fiction but they're constructs they're um they're characters that are composited out of lived experience um so the the mother character um my mother likes scarfield so like that's why that ended up and my my mother has the uh the calendar for the Catholic Church. Um, so I, I just use those. My mother is not like this character in other ways, <laughs> in a lot of other ways. Um, but I was um, I was borrowing some of the details from from her for that. Um, the house is my parents. The house I grew up in, um, and and so I could easily picture it and can and reconfigure it. Uh, turn it around in my mind because I had a kind of three dimensional understanding of it. Um, and the guy was sort of like, he, um, he was a mixture of people, uh, uh, sort of listless guys I knew growing up. Um, but also he's a lot, there, there's some of me in there. Um, I knew a, I knew a guy in college who spent a lot of time lifting weights so he could play speed metal drumming. Uh, <laughs> that was his big, awesome. it was also like a, like a genius philosophical, like he was getting his PhD. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I borrowed that from his life. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a, it's a piecing together, um, until they, until they seem fleshed out, you know, and, and alive. I want them to feel like they are leading, they have a life and I get to kind of look in on it and, and try to paint it, um, rather than feeling like, oh, I've written these characters. Like, I don't want them to feel like characters anymore. I want them to, to feel alive. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. We have a couple of questions and comments as well. So somebody said characters in your paintings and animations are everyday people doing ordinary things and the spaces they, inha they inhabit feel familiar. So I think that almost kind of goes back to like the the concept of alone together where it's like you they're shared experiences that they're experienced by different people. But we all kind of have had these these experiences, especially like how you said at the beginning that it's like day in, day out, you're doing the same repetitive thing for mm -hmm. sure. And there was also a comment, are the characters completely invented or do you take photos to bring them to life? The, uh, I, I tend to work everything up through drawing. Um, and with the animations, I'll have like a written outline and then I'll spend a lot of time drawing and I'll storyboard and do, and do that sort of thing. For the specific character design, um, I will, I might have like some vague idea. Maybe it's like, sort of like a, like I kind of knew the mom's hairstyle. Like I was like, she's going to have that kind of curl perm thing. My mom had a perm when I was growing up. Uh, so a little bit of that. But then I based part of her appearance off the, the mom from the uh, from Friday the 13th, uh, the <laughs> horror movie. Uh, she's kind of a terrifying mother. Um, so I, I was borrowing here and there and I would I did tons of drawings. I would draw from photos, but then I would always uh, do more drawings from those photos to, or from, I would do drawings from the drawings. So I'd get it kind of away from the photographic. So I want everything to have the same kind of, uh, reality, like be made out of the same stuff. And, and, uh, at the time I felt like if I had a photo of a face and then I was making up something else that there'd be this discrepancy between the two. Um, and so I would just sort of draw the characters until I felt comfortable moving them around. Awesome. That's awesome. I thought um, the the first shot you get of the face of the sun looks like Cameron from Ferris Bueller to me. <laughs> so it's interesting that you have like the Friday the 13th mom, the like media. <laughs> um, anybody else have any questions? And if not, we can go ahead and move 
onto three rooms. Yeah, I'm happy at the end to answer questions about either video. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So maybe we can just go ahead and um, get started with three rooms whenever you're ready. If you want to preface it up first and uh, we'll sure. get going. So um, in some ways, this animation picks up where uh, between the days left off uh, in the in the sense that I was I was thinking about what is the life of the space, the life of the the home or these rooms that people lived in. Um, and at the time I was, a uh, uh, my partner was pregnant and, uh, so we were about to have our first child. So I was thinking about, uh, uh, a growing, you know, a, a family with a kid. Um, and I wanted this, I wanted to imagine a narrative space that, uh, that three people could inhabit. So I essentially just grew the project by one person. Um, but, uh, it, the uh, video wound up being uh, split yet again. So there, uh, there's an anim an animated sequence or a series of animated sequences done with acrylic uh, and a material called flash, which is like a vinyl paint uh, on canvas. And you don't see any figures in those. You just, uh, the camera just sort of moves through spaces and objects move as though there's some hand moving them, but you can't see them. Um, so it's a sort of a space that is uh, effectively effectively haunted by the people that had lived there. Um, and then within that, we go inside of, there's a sort of story within the story. Um, the, uh, the three characters are a, a, a father, a mother, and a, and a daughter. Um, the father is a science fiction writer. Um, and so the story within the story, we go inside of his science fiction novel. Uh, the the mother is a, a, a science a scientist of fungi, a mycologist, um, and the daughter is a little uh, is a child. Um, but in the science fiction book, uh, I I was working on this project in 2018, and I was trying to think about a scale of action uh, of human action that goes way beyond the the human lifetime. Uh, so I just took the date and doubled it. Um, and so the, the guy's book is called 4036. And so we go into this double date, this, lo this longer, that didn't, wasn't what I meant, but you know what I mean? Go, I went, we go deeper into the, into the future beyond where it's easy to imagine, uh, you know, a hundred years out, we can start to imagine something, but 2000 years out, it becomes so difficult. Um, and I was thinking about the repercussions of our actions in the, uh, in the time of global warming and how simple habits have uh, effects that ripple out 10,000 years or more. Um, so then within that uh, future scenario, the daughter is grown and she explores this world of, uh, of the future, um, but winds up back at the house again. And there you see the parents, but they're sort of locked in their routine. Uh, their day to day. Um, anyway, I'll let it. I'll let you uh, watch it, and I'll I'll stop and and chat again in a bit.
All right, if we could pause it for a moment. Um, so some things are different than the last animation. Um, one major difference is that I, I built some three-dimensional sets for this project. Um, because the I was thinking about how uh, important the spaces were, the sets gave a way to create an added experience of depth. Um, so the initial shot that you see is the door to the house, and it's just a painting, the door opens. But then we see another door, so we're going through a series of openings. Um, and that one is actually a piece of uh, a standee I built. Uh, it's a piece of wood that's painted, and the door is functional. Um, it's only about this big, um, so very small. But then the painting behind it is more than six feet. Uh, the chair it depicted in that painting is, is life-size. Um, so uh, I needed it to be that difference in scale to create the, the shift in focus that I wanted to, to work with. Um, so that's one really big difference. Otherwise, I'm still working uh, in the same kinds of paint on large canvases. Uh, but when uh, we go into the science fiction world, um, I started working in uh, watercolor and sumi ink on a plastic film called Duralar. And I would put that on a light box. So it was sort of a self-illuminated painting. Um, and I wanted the, the kind of material reality of that science fiction world to feel really different, to feel like, okay, we've, we've burst into some other world. And I also, uh, for the first time, am working uh, with a much more animated language. So there's still trails and things like that, but everything is breathing and boiling and living. Um, and I wanted that kind of stark contrast between uh, the, the present tense paintings, which start to feel like the past, and then this kind of future tense that feels really alive um, and present. So bringing uh, uh, sort of the future uh, to the present. Um, so that was the, the sort of daughter character we saw in a hazmat suit leaving a bunker uh, uh, in one of a, at, at, at the way I imagined it, one of a series of explorers going out into, the, into a world uh, uh, that is now overgrown with mushrooms and has sort of been reclaimed uh, 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 by, the, by the fungi while human beings have uh, kind of messed things up and, and gone underground. All right, we can continue. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
If we just pause for one moment. For the sake of time, I'll try to be a little briefer. Um, but that was obviously the the mother's workspace. Um, and, uh, and as research for this project, I actually grew my own mushrooms. They don't need any. They don't need to be in a greenhouse. Uh, they don't need light at all. Um, but paintings look a lot better with interesting light, so that's why they're in a greenhouse. Um, we'll revisit her space soon. Um, but like the the previous video. Um, this one is also preoccupied with work in a way. Um, so you see the uh, the father working on his novel, trying out first lines in the previous sequence. And then uh, in this one, you see her growing mushrooms, measuring them, taking notes and, and things of that sort.
All right, we we'll get paused. Um, so you, you may have noticed I'm I'm sort of preoccupied with making showing screens within screens in my videos and characters watch TV and uh, we look at computer screens. Um, other projects you you look at people's phones, um, and I I think we spend so much time looking through and experiencing through these kind of vehicles for mediation. Um, that it feels very natural to me to do it. Um, it's also an, an, an exciting excuse in a video to um, shift languages, to shift tempo, um, to explore genre. Um, in the case of uh, the previous project where I got to reenact uh, a Law and Order uh, episode or some, some uh, ridiculous commercials, um, or in this case, to kind of create an in-between space between the fictional, more liquid animated stuff and the uh, the larger scenes. Um, so in this case, this is the the one uh, part in the animation where the, the more uh, viscous paint is behaving more like the watercolor. Um, but each character has a kind of scene within a scene, a sort of uh, an, uh, an inset world um, that's a stepping stone to this uh, fictional future.
Thank you. Um, I could say more, but maybe uh, people want to ask some questions. Yeah, that was great. Um, as we're for some people to send some, I also ha I have more questions. <laughs> so, um, how my like biggest question now after watching a few and hearing you talk about how like these canvases are so big is how do you record these? What is like that? How do you put these together into an animation? Um, so for these are the only two animations where I worked on canvases that are like the size of the ones behind me. Um, because it's incredibly impractical um, and it makes it it makes it very hard to make things move it um, but uh, uh, what I would do is I just had a camera on a tripod and uh, I used a software called dragon frame uh, that would just let me see the footage it, it was tethered shooting so it would be tethered to the, the camera would be tethered to the laptop and I just had a controller that uh, with a very long cord um, and so I would change a little bit of the painting and then I would duck out of the frame and then expose the photograph. I would lie on the ground under the can under the canvas and then I would pop back up, <laughs> change something, flop down, shoot it, pop back up. Um, and I was able to play it back in real time with a little laptop near me to to see, oh, I need to slow this down. I just speed something up. Um, the the science fiction section, they're they're very small. They're uh, seven by 11 inches on a little light box. And I shot them on a copy stand. And uh, I thought, okay, this is the way to do it in the future. <laughs> so now uh, for the last, uh, the, the subsequent three projects I did, there were very small paintings. Um, I'm not saying I would never end it on the large things again, because I do love that sort of walk-in space. Um, but yeah, it does require uh, so much longer just to get the movements. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, that's a big undertaking. Yeah. So fun, you know. Yeah, absolutely. We do have a question. Um, could you talk more about how you plan your projects? Sure. Um, so the uh, usually I, I uh, while I'm in production on one, the next project starts popping into my head um, because it's it it often uh, it depends on the the project, but it can take a year or two to complete it. Um, to actually animate it and get it all put together. Um, and it can be, you know, you can, I feel restless. I want to get on to the next thing. And so what I'll often do is start thinking about it and planning it and writing an outline, uh, maybe even storyboarding and things like that. Um, but what it allows me to do is during a year of production on the previous project, I'm just, I'm just letting that, that idea sort of cook in the back of my mind. Um, and there are loads of ideas that are that I have that are terrible um, and can't come to fruition. So uh, if I can't enjoy thinking about them for a year <laughs> before getting to really do any work, then they're not good enough. Um, and if I can, then at least they have a chance. So I usually, th that, th that part of the process is very important. There'll be like just some notes. And then when I get around to it, then um, I do two things kind of at the same time. I start, uh, uh, storyboarding, which for me is like thinking about the characters, thinking about the spaces, what things are going to look like. And I and I take a sketchbook and I grid all the pages and do tiny drawings on one side. And on the other side, I'm doing uh, character studies and other kinds of information, more more informational kinds of drawings. That So that storyboarding process is happening simultaneously with a research process um, where I'm uh, collecting hundreds or thousands of photographs. I might be uh, doing research for materials and trying testing them out. Um, for instance, in, in three rooms, I built a lot of sets, uh, three dimensional sets. I used three of them in the animation, um, but I made 15, 20 that, and uh, many that failed and got, you know, they're in a, they're, they're in a landfill probably, uh, unfortunately, but, uh, it's ironic given the context, the content of the animation. But, uh, and I also like the, the Duralar animation process. I thought I was going to animate in these water-based markers that I thought I'd be able to re-wet. And I, I was, so I did all these drawings on the Duralar and it just didn't work. Uh, they would re-wet within the first hour. So it seemed like they would work, but if you let them sit for a week, the, the ink would cure and it wouldn't, it'd become waterproof. So, you know, there's lots of stuff like that. Um, 
this is a very long answer. Um, but once I've storyboarded, once I've collected, you know, a thousand images and done studies of them, and I know what everything looks like, uh, then I go and I paint everything that, uh, basically each camera angle is its own painting. Um, and I'll paint them all. I'll have 50, 60 paintings, uh, done, but that's the first frame of the sequence that I'm going to animate. Then I start animating. Um, once that, once I've got all that footage done and I'm watching it and I'm cutting it together, then I go back into reshooting. I'll see things that, oh, I missed something. Uh, I need some, some extra moment uh, of, of pause or I've cut something and I have to redo it or do it differently. So then I go back and I repaint things and then animate again. Um, and after I've done all of that, then I do the sound. Then I do a final, final edit. And uh, I think that's the complete answer. <laughs> Awesome. We have another question and I love this question. This was something I was thinking too. Can you talk about your color palette for the second animation? There's two worlds and then two different color palettes. Yeah. I, um, yeah, thank you. That's a good, that is a good question. Um, all good questions here tonight. Thank you. Um, the previous project I'd used a lot of a kind of rosy buttery light color and I, um, and it had a kind of warmth to it um that i felt contrasted the uh somewhat melancholy subject matter um with this one i wanted the color to feel um in the in the acrylic paintings to feel a little more washed out to feel like something was missing um and so i used a paler yellow color for that um and uh that came about kind of simultaneously with thinking about the sci-fi section because i was thinking of yellow as a color that in one sense, it seems very joyful and warm, uh, but also is a, is a kind of an emergency color. Um, and it could be a very toxic looking color. So I tried in the science fiction section to use a, a yellow that felt a little more um, toxic. It felt like, uh, and you know, there's images of like spores and, and, and fungi and things that um, uh, are not necessarily, you know, are just different from the human. Um, and so I had sort of these two versions of yellow uh, you know, one that was a sort of faded away and one that was sort of too assertive. Um, and so, yeah, that was how I, how I framed it. Um, in the acrylic ones, I used a full palette, but, uh, you know, I used any paint I wanted to mix those colors, but I used a restricted idea in my head. So I, I returned to the same temperature of light a lot. Um, in the science fiction one, I used a really restricted palette where I used, uh, this, this particular yellow, I can't remember which, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't recall off the top of my head, but I used maybe two or three colors of watercolor, maybe just, maybe not even that, maybe one. It might've been yellow and then Sumi ink, um, or maybe I had two yellows and then Sumi ink, and I would just mix between them. Um, Cause with the ink, with black plus yellow, you got green, so I could paint the foliage with that. I think I had a warmer kind of orangey sienna color I used a bit for the exterior of the house. Um, but yeah, so it, it might've been, three colors total to try to get that full palette. Awesome. Ferengiz, and I apologize if I'm saying your name wrong, also said, thank you, Matt, for this wonderful presentation. I've seen clips of your animations on Instagram before, but never in their entire length. And the worlds you create feel more real than the world itself. Oh, well, thank you. That's, yeah, very, I'm, that's so nice. I'm so excited that you were able to, that we're able to talk about more than just one of your animations. So folks who haven't seen Alone Together yet, um, the only one that we watch tonight that's in the show is Between the Days, and Three Rooms is not in the show. But um, we have just put in the chat Matt's website and Matt's Instagram. Please check out. It's awesome. <laughs> um, and I'll give it another second if there are any other questions. I have one last question. Um, so I don't consume a lot of like sci-fi media, <laughs> but what I have seen <laughs> So many people with if in this like post-apocalyptic world, they they use, you know, like you see like roaches and like thorn bushes, and it's like devoid of any life. So I think it's interesting that you decided to focus on like fungi and like mushrooms. And I know that they can grow on living and dead matter, but I wonder why you chose mushrooms as like the thing in this world. Yeah, I was um I wanted I I got interested in mushrooms. So that was, I mean, that's probably the simplest answer. I, did, I just found them really interesting. Um, but I was reading about um, 
mycoremediation, which is where mushrooms can process toxins uh, and sort of pull them out of things. Um, so for instance, after uh, Chernobyl, uh, the first thing to grow, um, and it grew in the reactor itself, uh, was a, a black mold um, that uh, basically like developed uh, so that it could endure this incredible amount of radiation and live. Um, and I was interested to learn that, that um, uh, like fungi have melanin, like our skin does. Um, and so the fungi, the, the, the black mold developed like a huge amount of melanin to, to endure this radiation. Um, because somewhere way back uh, in evolution, like we were, before we split, it was us and fungi, uh, just like that. Anyway, I, I, I just found that was so interesting. Um, and I just moved into a house that had some water damage. So there was like, there was like danger fungi and then there was like beautiful <laughs> magic fungi. Yeah. Uh, and there is mind controlling fungi that you see with that ant, the thing that bursts out of its head. Um, uh, if you read about parasitic things, you'll you'll find it. People go go look. Um, so that was fascinating. And then we were we, I was growing mushrooms to eat and just everything was uh, was amazing. And then, of course, there's like the visionary aspect. Uh, I read the Michael Pollan book. Um, uh, I won't tell you what I consumed, but it just, uh, you know, it just seemed like it, it touched on all these different ideas and the, and, uh, science fiction seemed like a kind of fertile place for, uh, allowing things to grow and do those things. And, and so, um, you know, that was something that was a pleasure to, uh, to do was to like paint the sci-fi writers office and to pin on the wall, like everything I would put all the research up. And then to go into the mycologist's uh, office and like put all that information into her laptop and like you know process it into some kind of moving image, um, so yeah, that was that was definitely like the starting point was like an interest, and then it just kept growing and growing and growing. And the animations animations are so good, films are so good at holding together lots of different things. Absolutely awesome. Well, Matt, this was amazing. Thank you so much. Everyone, again, we did put Matt's website and Instagram in the chat, so make sure you check him out. And Alone Together is open now until September 25th, so please make sure you go check it out. Again, we will have Between the Days up there. Um, and we just put a survey link in the chat as well. If you could take a couple moments to fill that out, that would be very appreciated. Your responses will help inform our programming, so thank you so much for doing that. And please tune in for our next program, which is in person. <laughs> um, it'll be on June 25th. We're having a queer artist mini mart and then our pride prom celebration. So that's pretty much all day on the 25th. We've been working really hard on it. We're very excited for it. Um, but again, thank you so much, Matt. And everyone have a great rest of your night. Stay cool. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.